Well, so you, here's, here's your first, first, here's your first at bat. Right? Well, yeah, but if you pause it, if you pause it, because this is how it all gets crazy. And so Edwin Encarnacion was hitting eighth. So imagine, like, he wasn't even there in his career yet. So he's hitting eighth, and he hits a double before me. So there's a man on second, nobody out. And so you're a nine-hole hitter, right? Uh-huh. What do you expect that person to try to do, man on second, nobody out? Fastball, right? Yeah. Well, you, you, as a hitter, what do you want to do with the man on second base, nobody Move out? Over. Move him over, right? Yeah. So then how do you combat that? Yeah. Is to throw him a fastball in. So I'm sitting there on deck, walking to the plate. I'm going, these guys are going to think that I'm this young kid trying to do the right thing. And... F that. I'm going to look for a fastball in, and I'm going to be ready to freaking whack this bitch. And plus, he thinks like a catcher, so he knows exactly. So then, that's where... The University of Tennessee. Put it up. The long-awaited first major league at bat. First pitch swinging. Aaron Seavey. And the first pitch? Yeah, so so that's what happened. Welcome to the big news. First, first pitch, I, I, I was looking for that pitch, and that's what happened. And when I hit it, I was like, no chance. So that I, I, I knew that I had took him deep, and I was like, you got to be freaking kidding me. <laughs> My mom jumping around. It's crazy, right? First Blue Jay since Junior Felix on May 4th in 1989. Hit a home run in his first big league at bat. And this time he goes the other way into the right field corner, giving Chase a Zobrist. Yeah, I was already setting the bar way too high. First two at bats, home run, double. Extra base hits for Aaron Sebia. When manager Dan Roan gave him the call and said, "You're not in the lineup tonight." Also, uh, you see, you pause it for a second. You see my batting gloves? You see they have a number ten on them, right? So this is the other things that how people think. So I get to the big leagues. Jose Bautista was having a year that had 50-plus home runs a year. Okay. And I drop head. Yeah. And then Vernon Wells okay. is a wow. star, right? So yeah. what do I do? I ask Vernon to let me use his batting gloves. No way. And I have Jose Bautista's bat during the game. No way. Yeah. Because they, oh, they're, they're killing it. I wanted a piece of what they were doing. Oh, my. So that's not even your bat. No, that's Jose Bautista's bat. Oh, my God. Bro. Oh, there was nothing stopping you, Eddie. No, I was dialed in. I, the ball looked like an absolute melon that day. First pitch swinging. Right field. Back at the track and gone! Can you believe it? was funny. He was telling me that's catching his game yesterday. Bro. He goes, bro, this guy hit a single, a double. He hit two home runs. I'm thinking, did he hit for the cycle? And then I was like, he didn't do that in one game. And you explained and I was like, oh, like, yeah, that was pretty good, like, first month or first week. Was, dude, that was his first game. I was like, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, let's, let's be honest. For me to hit a triple, it's going to take the outfielders to collide and then, and then have some kind of uh, issues because I, I'm not very fast. Let's put it at a... And then the curtain, that was the crazy part. Is you don't really understand like a curtain call, right? I don't understand the curtain call. And I got a curtain call my first game, which I was like, I just got chills. Because, I, dude, I, that was literally the only curtain call I got in my entire career. In my first game. It's so crazy, man. What do you think now when you see that? Honestly, it was, like, like, you don't, you just don't. You kind of for, I don't even know. It's kind of you, you. You don't really feel it really happened, right? Like that's the. And that's you, bro. Well, and here here's the thing too is the coolest part, and here's a it'll get it a little deeper, but we only see highlights, right? The fifth at bat of that bat was probably the coolest at bat. It was an out, so you don't see it, but it was probably the coolest at bat. But we're wired on seeing all the good stuff. But I came up my fifth at bat, and. Literally, as soon as they announce my name, there's an ovation. The entire at bat. So I'm walking, everybody's standing, clapping. I get in the box and I'm thinking, all right, it's going to die down. They're standing and clapping the entire at bat. So I was so, it was so like 
off to me because I was like, what is going on? This is ridiculous. <laughs> uh, that, that entire at bat, they did not sit down. They continued to clap and I fouled out. But it was like the craziest thing because I could not, I was in the box and I could not focus because all it was was me hearing this crowd and you expect, you know, cheers, whatever, and then it dies down. It did not die down that entire at bat. And I, I, and I got you're out. You're a rookie in Toronto, great fan base. You're putting on a show. I mean, they just want to give, give you respect and you, you, you don't know. It's your first day. It was just cool though. It was like super, that was like the coolest at bat of the, the game in the sense of like emotionally, like holy smokes. Dude, this is, these people are legitimately, I, I was just in Las Vegas where we, we would only get fans on Thirsty Thursday to get the dollar beer. <laughs> like, That's crazy. So, big league career, you keep going. Let's get into the, let's get into the nitty gritty where, where I think I can relate to you. I read that you started to suffer from anxiety attacks. Yep. Okay. So I'll make this quick. I've said this a thousand times in the podcast, but this is the reason why I started the podcast. I never had anxiety on the field. Actually, no, I take it back. I did, but I wasn't aware of what was happening to me. Okay. Perfect example. I would be on deck and all of a sudden, like, don't strike out, don't strike out, don't strike out. That's a form of anxiety. Yeah. You're, you're supposed to be relaxed in the moment. So little things like that. Like I will like put on a show today and then tomorrow is like, where did that guy go? That, that, was, that, that was the player that I was. It's probably why I didn't play in the Billies. Because uh, I, 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 I tell my friends now, I, if, I, if you put me in a modern stadium today to hit BP, I could probably fool you. I mean, I probably can't hit off the guys, but I, yeah. you know, I can, but yeah, everybody has the mental side. So that touched my heart a lot because I never had it that bad on the field. I would get it, but then I was like, I don't know, you kind of like, you, you shift, you adjust and, and you pivot, but it hit me really bad when I was done playing baseball. Really, really bad. Uh, to the point where I had a panic attack and I ended up in an ambulance thinking I was having a heart attack. And then that's how this whole thing came about. I, I pretty much told myself, I went to therapy and the therapist tells me, you know, you've had anxiety since you were a child. I go, oh, and what do you mean? I just started having this now. I said, no, 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 you've had anxiety. So he took me back and I'm like, oh my God. Like, yeah, I remember high school, I went through this. Or, or in college, I went through that. And I literally had no self. I was not aware of this. So let's talk about your story and how we can, like, how we can maybe help athletes that are, are going through the same thing because more people are going through it and nobody wants to talk about it. Well, that's... And the, I don't think there's... I have no shame in talking about it. The talk about it is the big part, right? Because mm -hmm. I think as a kid, you're always taught, like, hey, suck it up suck it up, suck it up, right? Like, yeah. I, I, Especially us athletes. I mean, I, I was taught my whole life to suck it up. Yeah, I, I, my, they were always... I talk about that all the time. They would always tell me like, hey, unless there's a bone that's broken in your body, you're not coming off yeah, the well. field, all that stuff, so suck it up, right? So now I think there's good things about being tough. You don't want to be like just a... But that's what I did. So where for me it was tough was ego plays a big part of that, right? Ego pride. I was also, I was always anxious in the sense of like, for example, I'd get a cold. I'd think that I was dying of cancer. Even as a kid, like I would think that I'd have the worst thing possible and I had a sneeze, right? So I kind of was already anxious minded. Um, but I went from, we just watched my debut being the man winning the MVP in AAA, coming up to the big leagues. My first year in the big leagues, my rookie year, hit 23 home runs, break the record for the rookie catchers, blah, blah, blah. Fast forward to my third year, right? I'm on every billboard. I'm on, I have my own bobblehead day, all these different things. And I start struggling, right? And I had struggled before my career, but I had never struggled at this level because in the minor leagues, you struggle in Vegas. Well, I have one person asking me a question after a game. No one's there. doesn't matter. You're on. Uh -huh. Now you have a whole media. Now you have all the media. And then remember, at this point, social media was around. So you have an entire country because the Blue Jays are only the only big league team in the entire country. And then you have social media outlet. So I end up start to struggle. And 
I have no idea what's going on. I rattle my brain. I'm thinking, how am I going to get out of this? All this stuff. Are you, is it struggling offensively? Yeah, offensively. It's off, it's crazy how offensively is the one that gets you. Yeah. Because you could be struggling defensively and you, nobody cares. Like, oh, I dropped the ball or yeah. for you, uh, you know. But you're, here's the thing too, though, is defensively, if you're making three out of 10 plays, you're not, you're not, not playing. you're not playing, but mm-hmm. if offensively three out of 10 is, so that's, that's why I don't think that you look at it as much. Cause you're really not failing. Let's, oh, I have a nine ninety seven fielding percentage. Mm-hmm. It's different, but it started, it started really eating at me because I went, as, I was a fan favorite and then I was getting booed at my own home field. And then I was like starting to get scared to walk into restaurants because of what people were thinking about me. And I was reading thousands of thousands of comments after every game telling me how much I sucked. So hold on a minute. And then I want to talk about that because I think that you are right in that, right when social media really became uh, what it is today Yeah, was right when you started playing. When I got to the big leagues, pretty much. I, like, I didn't have, we didn't have Instagram when I was in the minor leagues, right? So, and I wasn't a big leaguer, but I didn't, you know, I, I didn't, whatever. I can only imagine that now you're going on, on the gram or you're going on Twitter or you're going Well, yeah, on- Twitter, honestly, Instagram wasn't even a thing then yet. It was more it was just more Twitter. Twitter. Twitter was like. And what happened? You came, became obsessed at looking at. at, at almost a masochist, dude. Like I legit would read comment after comment about how much I sucked and this and that. And it would just to then to the point where like at two in the morning, I was waking up full on panic, like my heart coming through my chest. But again, you get to a point where you think when the panic attack happens, you think that it's never going to end and then it ends Mm -hmm. and you're like, all right, I can take a breath. And now life is normal, not normal, but I'm back, mm-hmm. so I did get over it, and then it became this vicious thing of I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to – I'll go to the field every – because you know this in baseball. You ain't hiding from something because it's every single – you have to go to the yard every day. And so I went from being that player that we just watched of I was so ready because I was, I was ready to compete to the guy who was so scared to compete, driving to the field. I would think of a situation in my head – in my stomach, that anxiety would start just turning, turning, turning. And then being the guy on deck, like you're saying, man on third base and like praying that the guy in front of me gets the job done because I didn't want to hear the booze from the crowd that I, if I didn't get the job done. So when he would get the runner in, I was like, oh, thank God I don't have to deal with that. And that's what I was going through every single day. Every at bat. Every at bat. And and I would go home and I'd still panic and I didn't, you know, at this time I was dating girls when seriously. You, when you would panic, what do you, dive deep into that. What, what, it's, you create an, an image in your, in your head, a situation. Yeah. The, and, and it was just like, I don't want to be in that situation. Yeah. You like, just. Don't hit me the ball. Well, yeah, that's a, it, defensively became almost a little bit of a, of a, of a saving grace for me because I was, it would allow me to kind of get away. F- I couldn't, for position players, I don't know how they do that because there's so much idle time in playing a position. As but a catcher, I'm, I, I couldn't, right? So I had to be thinking, hey, who's on deck? Who's in the bullpen? All these different things. To But offensively, dude, it was, which I then eventually started, I, I learned that I was so scared of failing that I was, I would try to swing at the first pitch to get the at-bat with over, with like over with because I did not want to deal with subconsciously. I was getting up to the plate and where you have your, your routine, all this stuff. I would get in the plate, stand in the box, try to swing at the first pitch. And I, w- I wanted to get out of the box because I was. And you didn't go talk to nobody. You didn't, you, you, you no. couldn't tell nobody, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm in a bad funk. No, because think about it, right? Again, here's the suck it up. So I always just think like, it'll get, it'll get, pa- I'll get passes. I'll get passes. And then, yeah, you have a guy who's a, your mental coach on the team, but as a player, I'm about to go to arbitration or I'm playing for this team and I'm going to go to the person who's paid by this team and tell them what's going on through my head. I may not have a job if I tell them what actually I'm going through, right? So I didn't want to go to that person to, t- to get help from them. 
and as boys in the clubhouse, no one's opening up about, hey, dude, I was so scared to have this at bat. No one, because it's it's just not something that's spoken about, right? You're just you don't think your players were aware. No, a lot. You I've it, you guys that well. Guys, guys would tell me like, hey, dude, I didn't know what you were going through that year, and and it would happen at home. Yeah, dude, at home. When I honestly, and it's like your safe place, right? Because I, I remember when I would go through, I'd swan or go home. See, the whole honestly, I was the opposite. Me being distracted was the best thing on the planet for me. I used to despise when the sun would go down because I knew that at some point I was going to have to lay down in my bed. And when I lay down in my bed and the distraction stopped, the hamster started going. And, dude, that's when I would have one thought to the next thought to the next thought. And all of a sudden, my heart was coming through my chest. I know. And for me, I, I did the same thing where I went through it for like two years thinking, oh, I can get over this, 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 before I finally went to see a therapist. I'm like, dude, I could have seen somebody like two years ago and I have been suffering. I had a panic attack every single day for one year. And it's, I'm not joking. And, it, and any, Lit, Literally. My uncle one time showed up to my house and I was sweating. And I think he realized. Because you're red? Bro, I thought this is the end of me every single day. Yeah. And then I got afraid of having them, which what does that do? No, it's Brings a vicious them on even more. It's a it's a vicious it's, it's a, a vicious, vicious cycle. cycle. And it was for me, it was a pressure of life. It was a pressure of that I couldn't run back to the field. It was the opposite. But it doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying? The point is that was my issue. My issue was I got to like I can't I, I can't even relate to certain people no more like I, I, don't, I don't have to practice. I don't have to lift. I went for job interviews, and I'm like, I would look around me. I'm like, what the fuck, man? What is this? You know? And then the guy who drafted me was a guy named Pepe Ortega. Yeah. And I called Pepe. I'm like, Pepe, I need to go back. I made a mistake. Because I was never released. I decided to walk away from the game. So did I. Because um, I was 24 in A-ball, high A-ball. I had played one AAA game in spring training. And I'm like, you know, I didn't want to be that guy who was there forever. 25 years old, turning 25. And then I had no idea, dude. I thought I was ready. And I was ready. Based on wise, I was ready. I wasn't ready from the disconnect of the locker room and the structure. That's what I, what I, what I, what I, what I loved, you know? Well, I mean, you love the game and well, all that, no doubt. But you get to a point where you're like, all right, dude. I'm not going to make it. Like, I, I'm cool with that because I was such a hard worker, JP, that I know I gave everything I had. So I was at peace with that. I wasn't at peace with like, oh, shit. Like, this is really over. Well, I just I just listened to a thing, and it made a lot of sense to me, and it talks about how anxiety is. I, I listened to a lot of stuff on anxiety. I started to learn about it more yeah. now well, and more appreciate you it. Yourself, the better. And there was just something this guy was talking about where they think that they, uh, the doctor was saying that, we were, were such social packs o over time. We used to be tribes, right? Like you, we, we, we all lived together and like now it's become such an individual world and it would taken me to the clubhouse and like being, because that's where I felt most comfortable is when I was with a big amount of people. And then when I was around myself and that's what he thinks is the biggest, a, a big difference, not the biggest, but a big difference is like, we don't have those same tribes anymore. And we don't have that soul, that community anymore. We're very, we're very individualized. And so it was like, dang, that's kind of, because when I was at the field, right? What's weird is when I was at the field walking around the clubhouse, I wasn't having this anxiety. But as soon as the lights turned on, then I was out there. You're on, you're on your own, right? When you're in the batter's box, you're on your own. Yeah. And that's where stuff started flipping out. And then again, then I'd go home, man, I would stay at the clubhouse as long as I could because until the last person was gone and then I'd go to the, my mom used to always give me crap. She's like, why you always stay? You're the last one. And it was more because I, dude, I was scared to go home. Did you tell your parents? No, I didn't tell anybody. See, that's the thing. I never told my parents either. Dude, no, I didn't. And then I got to a point where I thought I was going crazy. That was even more screwed up. I'm like, oh, I'm losing my mind now. Well, this he, is really bad. Well, he, from, that's when, when you can't talk about it, that's when you're really fucked. Well, that's, I say that I use the word fucked because it, it, it is. It is. I'm going straight to it. I Listen, mean, that's I'm, how you I, feel, man. Yeah, I don't know if you however, if you've ever felt this, but like when I'd see people on the street talking to themselves or like going yeah. crazy, I yeah. used to be like, 
Is this what I'm going to turn into? I know, man. Because know. because it was like, I'm like, dude, I felt you feel like you're kind of losing your sense of self and your mind and all those different mm-hmm. things. But so fast forward a little bit, and I, I get released after that season, non-tender. I was going to go to arbitration, get released. I signed a big league deal, opening day starter for the Texas Rangers. So I don't, I still, I went through an off season and I was like, like anything, right? Let's put a Band-Aid on it. Uh, new year, don't, I didn't invest in telling anybody. I was like, you know what? I'll train in the off season. I'll be back and, and I'll, I'll be ready so to go. So this is just between you and the guy in the mirror. That's it. So train that off season, opening day starter. I start off slow again that year and it, the wheels fall off again, mentally. Like, I think I'm, I'm in a good place, da, da, da. Start struggling again. And then here comes, dude, Mr. Anxiety. And I am same spot scared to compete I, I was so scared to swing and miss because of how ron washington the manager would look at me and i'm having these conversations in the batter's box facing felix hernan hernandez felix yeah felix hernandez, hernandez yeah, yeah from the mayors. mayors and i'm like going back and i'm and i'm going i'm right back in it and again i don't say anything right i'm i'm just freaking spinning dude my and I think a tough thing too for me, my wife at the time was an entertainer. I had gotten married. She was an entertainer and she was on tour. So I was by myself a lot. And I think that's another thing. The idle mind sucks. So when I'd go back home, idle mind is a devil's playground. it's terrible. And so I would just, and it would, I would spin out of control. So the vicious cycle continued to happen. So did you tell your wife you were going through that? No, time? nothing, not nothing yet. So I did. She's I, clueless to this too. No. Yeah, dude, I'm, I'm just grinding. It's good. I, it, I, I know, I, until you break. So then here's where I break. And then I, I, I just, because I want to speed it up because I want to get into some other stuff. But so next year, I finished that year actually pretty strong. I get go down to AAA. They send me down, come back, finish pretty good. I get to spring training the next year. It's the first year I'm actually competing for a, a spot. Now, if I thought that there was pressure in being an everyday starter, Whatever. If I thought there was pressure and being the guy with Texas and getting sent down and come back up and do my job, I didn't know what pressure was when you're in spring training and you have a minor league deal and you're trying to compete against Matt Weeders and certain guys to win this this either backup job or starting job for the Baltimore Orioles. And so, dude, I legit was so bad that spring training. I'm talking about couldn't even catch balls to where they, they were like, hey, what's wrong with you? And I was like, ah, you know, it's just I'm putting pressure on myself. I wouldn't say till I took a nap one day and with my wife and I woke up in one of those middle of a panic attack, heart coming through the chest. You stand up out of bed. You're walking around. You're like freaking out. I don't wish that upon anybody. I hear I, and I feel you though. And she, she, the first time she had ever seen that. And she was like, what was that? I was like, well, I've been dealing with this for the last couple of years. She's like, you need to get help. And I was like, well, you know, and she's like, no, you need to get help. And that was the first time that anybody had ever really seen what I would go through because I'd have these often, when, especially, you know, once the season started going. And she finally saw like, so then I, I got help. And I started talking to somebody and I started, I still hadn't been public about it yet, but I was seeing somebody that was helping me. I got prescribed Lexapro. Mm -hmm. And that year I was a different person. The Lexapro allowed, because what I was taught was the Lexapro just doesn't allow you to kind of stew on something, which is where when we get that thought in our head, and you learn this in meditation. Well, you learn that. But what the medication does is it when you've been out of balance for so, so long, imagine that I told you right now, pick up a, a, a dumbbell and just do curls every single day. What happens to your bicep muscle? Your, your brain's a muscle, right? Yeah. You're just going to tear it up. Yeah. Well, imagine every single day you're in a fight in your mind. Your brain's tired. So what it does is it kind of just gives it a little bit of deviation so you can get kind of get yourself balanced and, and, and going again. So that year I ended up 
I, I got hurt. Yeah, I'm not a doctor, but I'm just telling you from experience. Yeah, no. So so I so I got to so I got that year. I ended up going to AAA to start the year. Get get to to, to Tampa. Got called up. Had a phenomenal month and a half in the big leagues. He hit over 300. Hit six home runs. I was hitting fifth for the Tampa Bay Rays September or August September 2015, and I went from being the guy who was so scared to play. <laughs> I would look at the pitcher starting that day and go, shit, I'm a, I got no chance. Like, that's how my – I was so defeated to I'd never forget facing F- Jose Fernandez in Tampa and going, hell yeah, I get a chance to compete again. Like, I had gotten into that kind of – Mode. Mode to where I was – I was looking forward to having fun again and competing again um, on, the, on the baseball side of things. And I think that was something that was cool because um, I I was able to get to a point finally where I was understanding what happened. So now I play that season, great year. Next year I'm going to spring training and I go to the Phillies. I, I sign with the Phillies. I'm in a minor league deal, but I'm in a better place. And that's when I finally started speaking about anxiety. And I finally came out on, on a on a – interview and i publicly said like this is what i struggle this is this i would have and dude the amount of people that wrote to me on dms and like hit me up i was like wait a second all these people deal with this too and but here's the thing though they would I dm me the same thing with friends and family dude. it was crazy and i'm going which kind of helped me you think you're on your own dude. oh do you think you're the it's it it your mind plays tricks on you homie i mean you think you're alone big time and so that was a huge point in my life in the sense of when i started speaking about it one you feel like the weight is like starting to shed off of you just by speaking of, of it and then two was when these people were texting me, people that were like prominent people that I was like, no chance this person has any kind of doubt or or like crazy thoughts. Business owners. Powerful, powerful people. people. I get it. And, I feel you. And you're like, wait, that guy goes through it? Well, then, okay. then And you start to feel like, okay. By the way, highly successful people, it's very common for them to, t- to suffer a little bit from anxiety. It's very common. Well, I mean, I I would imagine because you put so much you put so much pressure and all, and, you, and you, there's the the pressure's there whether you put on yourself or not. I mean, it's it's there. It's it's and plus you're smart, so you think through the process. You see what others don't see. The average individual only sees, and again, I say that respectfully. Um, you see ahead of you. You see behind you. You see the future. Imagine you have that gift, where somebody else is just like. Just coasting. You don't. No. And that's that's your gift and it's your curse. Curse, exactly. It's the blessing and the curse, dude. I always but that's so that's something for me that that really started and then I started learning about anxiety. What is it? Why does our brain go? Yeah. Why does it why do we think and I started look, learning meditation? Like how do I slow down instead of the thought coming into my head and going into, you know, this is the one thought, and then I made it to that a crazy place that you the brain gets it to that all of a sudden you're spinning out of control your, your thoughts aren't real man but dude being being real and that's why i said i want to be real in this podcast like i got so scared of fear of failure that i i was scared for sport i was scared like with a girl that i was gonna perform or not perform like i like legit and that's another thing that men it's tough to talk about is to go like dude i was about to be with a girl, and I was freaking out because if I was going to fail. Mm-hmm. And I was, I had gotten to that point that it had taken over You're my... Sweating. Dude, my, my, I would avoid... You, you almost avoid situations because it's like, man, I just don't want to be in any situation so that I can fail in. Mm-hmm. And that, that was a huge part of my life where anxiety and all these different things, and I've had to learn and continue. It's always about... I never say that I'm past it because I... It never goes away. But, I, but I've started to learn to tell myself like what you're telling yourself is not true. And, and we, we still will battle it. it the, the, the thoughts still pop. Now I'm single and I have to date people. And it, I still battle with like the anxiety that creeps in your head about certain situations or this and that, but it's, it's, Dude, I was talking to a buddy of mine yesterday. Um, 
good buddy of mine just got recently divorced. Um, good looking guy. He's, you know, he's women, you know, he's got people that every once in a while, he's, you know, he's at a bar, he's at a club and, he, and it's, he's, he's a male. He's, and he's, he's a great, he's a great guy. And he, and he, he wants to, you know, he's, he's starting to like date little by little. And he told me he freaks out. He said, bro, I was with a girl for so long. This is all I know. And he, and it hits him too. Dude. I mean, the, the, the thing is that everybody goes through it. No, nobody has a balls to talk about it. You understand? And that's ego. It is. It's unhuman for you to say, bro, I was married and I've had this. You, were, you had a certain structure. That goes away. That's a bad feeling, right? Now you got to kind of redo this again. It's difficult, bro. It's challenging. And that, and that's where when you ask me about the podcast, and I think just talking in general for guys, girls, whatever it may be, I think that when you can talk and relate because the biggest thing for me is realizing that you're not by yourself. You're not mm-hmm. alone and that other people that other people have these issues and all the other people, you know, there's there's a lot of different things that people battle, mm-hmm. but you're not by yourself. And I always and I always think, you know, sometimes and this is a crazy thing is like you see people with suicide and stuff like that. And it mm-hmm. always scares me to think like, where did that person get to that they mm-hmm. finally thought that this is the only answer. And, and I, it's, listen, that's scary, as, bro. And we've had panic attacks. And if you have a panic attack, you know that there's places that your mind goes that you're like, am I ever, is this ever going to leave? Bent. Yeah. Am I going to be like this for the rest of my life? And so I always feel like, where does that person, how could that person have heard somebody talk or how could that person have been in a, in a group or something that was allowed to go like, Hey man, I deal with the same thing. You know, your friend or whoever, my, myself, like, Listen, you take a home, a girl home, and it's like you almost freak yourself out because you, you hit this ego and all this stuff is like, I want to put on a show. I can't. I'm a I'm a dude. I can't. What if I go thirty seconds? I'm a clown. Or what happens if it doesn't even? Let's go even further. The the shit doesn't work. All these things creep into your head, and you're like, what the heck? Like wh- where where? But it's but it's understanding again that. Dude, we all have our battles. We all have our issues. But for me, it's like, how can we continue to talk about it and not be like, hey, dude, what's wrong with you? Like, nothing's wrong with me. This is what I battle. Well, what do you battle? Well, Because we all do. But I think that's the, that's just the, the way that we think is like we're, we're less than. No doubt. You know what worked for me? Letting go of control. I think that Whenever I feel anxious or stressed out about any situation, I'm trying to control something that's out of my control. And I think that we, as a society that's moving so fast, uh, the, you have social media, you have, er, everything is now, 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 right? We are kind of rewiring ourselves, right? In some, in some in, you know, in some some way but it's it really comes down to the root is fear that isn't the one root half the shit you're thinking about isn't real yeah it's 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 what's well, the creative it's, it's the creative mind that that's the bad part of your creative mind you make and stories it, up and it really comes down to like a surrender dude like you know what like t- trying to like just let it just, and it's easier said than done, but it really comes down to just like not trying to control it. Well, if, and if like, you know, and, and, and I've had guys, in this, I mean, Larry Johnson was one of them. Larry Johnson sat in the same, in this same seat. And Larry came out and says, like, dude, I've been hitting the head how many times in the NFL? The guy's a big dude, bro. I don't know if you're Larry Johnson, but yeah, yeah, running yeah. back, yeah, running back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... I told him the same thing. I said, it, it comes down to letting go of control. You can, you can simplify the process. And I'm telling you, this, was, this has been a decade. Now I go back, I realize how certain people in my family had it. I wasn't aware of it. Yeah. Nobody attacked it. That's another thing. I admire you that you're, you, you have, you're, you're attacking the problem. So that you have kids, you can identify it in them identified in your wife, vice versa. And bro, it also reminds you that you're only human. 
you're just you're a big leaguer, J, JP. Uh, you made a lot of money. It's, you drive a nice car. It's great, but you're human, dude. But here's the thing too: is you know this is you know? when you're going through it. I would I I'd give away all my money. I'd give away every game that I played in big leagues to wake up and have my my mind be and have your peace. And that and that's why I walked away. At Thirty one. I was still, I could still play. And I just said, dude, I just am, I am tired of beating myself up mentally for so long. But the whole thing of my story is how we started and how I ended was the reason why in Tampa Bay, I was having fun again, competing, right? Was because I was present. And I had, there's a guy who I used, Ken Revisa, who was a sports psych guy and he helped me out a ton in mm-hmm. on the baseball field because okay. you still have your battles off the field but on yeah. the baseball field and it happened he used to ask me like hey how was your at bat today like go go by each of your bats and I would say yeah I got out on a slider I don't know and uh, I think my third at bat you know I struck out on this and I couldn't tell him recite my at bats this is the night after my game and then to fast forward when I was with Tampa I was like hey first pitch fastball away Took it, ball one. Second pitch, curveball, took it. Ball, 2-0, threw me a fastball, base out up the middle. And I was – but the only reason why I could recite that is because I was present every single pitch. And that's when I was actually not scared because where I went from before that I was thinking about all these different things and then a ball was coming at me, it was finally the first time that I was like – fully being present and then fast forward that to real life is think about the times that you're having a great time and you're present and you don't think about anything and you're just in the moment and then all of a sudden for whatever reason you back away and then your your head starts thinking mm-hmm. that if there was one thing people ask me like hey what could your, your superpower be it would be living learning like being 100% present every day because if I'm living in the moment like, I'm not worried about what happened yesterday, which is a lot of our anxiety. I'm not worried about the date that I'm about to go on the girl with this girl on later at 7 o'clock, and am I man enough to make sure? Do I seal the deal? Did all these, all these different things that come into our head, you end up enjoying the moment. And that's, and that's where I think that's where, like, true peace is, is in the sense of, and, and, and it's kind of how you're saying letting go is being able to get to a point where, Good or bad, I'm in the moment. And if it's bad, you're still in the moment. You're not about 10 minutes later, you're not going to be fretting about what just happened because you're still in the moment. I'll, I'll simplify it more for you. Your first up bat in the big leagues, you were so in the moment. You said the ball looked like a watermelon. They could have thrown anything at you. The best athletes slow the game down. You know that. Yep. I know that. 95 looks like 85 to you. Or it can be the flip side. 89 looks like 100. And you don't understand why. And it, you look at Jordan. You look at Tiger when Tiger was Tiger. You look at J.P. Adensibe when J.P. Adensibe wasn't that. And you're, you look at all you guys. When you were at your best, you were there. Raul Ibanez hit a home run in 2016 ALCS against the Baltimore Orioles. Pinch it for A-Rod in the bottom of the ninth inning. I remember that. Okay? Yeah. He just shared this in the podcast. So he gets a pinch hit for A-Rod, right? So he's thinking, dude, I'm hitting for Alex Rodriguez. A-Rod, right? And as he's on deck, he's saying, bro, imagine that I fail. Like, what are the New York Times going to write tomorrow? The Wall Street Journal? Whatever. He has all this garbage in his head while he's on deck. So if you watch the back closely, he starts tying his shoes. And he delayed himself so that he can kind of gather his thoughts when he went with the bat. And he saw all of a sudden he was in the zone, and like two pitches later he hit the jack to tie the game, and he hit one in the bottom of the 12th inning to win the game. My point is he was able to just like get into that moment. He's, I mean, he hit the home run, and I'm like, he says it hit him like two weeks later. He's talking to his son, RJ. He's like, dude, I did that? That's why I asked you. I want to see if you had the same feeling. Like, That's me? Yeah. Because when you do it, I, I, you know, like, at any level, whenever you have a great sports moment or any sort of, of, you know, victory like that, like, 
you're in the moment. It doesn't really hit you what's going on around you. But you're so right, man. The present moment. The present moment is really all we have. The only thing that's really real right now is that you and I are sitting here in this podcast room having a conversation. My family's out in the world. I have no idea what my son, my daughter's doing, what my wife is doing. Where it's always been in my nature to worry and to, and to, and to try to control. And where's my wife? And what are my kids doing? And in reality, I've learned to put that faith in God and to be like, you know what? As much as I love my family or as much as I want to close a certain deal or as much as I, whatever the case may be, is the only thing I can control is what Fernie's doing. So I, what I've done is I'm all in on preparation. I think preparation is the best confidence builder and really focus on this is, the, the, and this is going back to the athlete, right? I'm going to show up to the batting cage. I'm going to take my cuts. But you and I both know that I can go up to bat, get the pitch I wanted, turn the shit around, and hit it right at Yeah. And you're out, right? Yeah. So I have no control of the result. But that's kind of what's helped me is really dial in to what, what, what Fernie's doing. And then having faith because I can't, without the faith part, I can't not worry. You know, it's impossible personally for me. Like, I mean, for ev- I, I mean, for everybody, and, and for w- not even like in the religious sense. I faith is obviously I, I'm in the same boat as you religiously, but I'm saying faith. You have to have you have to have. There's the light at the end of the tunnel. You have to have no something. Doubt. Everybody does whatever you believe in, whatever it is. But that's for me. That's life in general. And I wish I would have. I wish I would have been more vulnerable when I was maybe younger to talk about things and like learn, look into the mental side of stuff in sense, in sense of just learning about how we work. But life is the same thing. We're 88 in life. And that, that day that looks like, man, this is, I'm in the day. I'm in the moment. I've been in the moment the whole day. What a great day. And maybe you didn't do anything crazy. You just enjoyed the day because you actually really enjoyed the day as opposed to like those anxiety days that it's like, and I, and I mean, you don't even know what happens. And that's, and that's something, you know, again, I, I, I think that the more we talk about it, I told my niece the other day, like I woke up in the morning, we were in Disney world for, mm-hmm. for Thanksgiving. And I said, Hey, today's the best day of your life. And she was like, what? She's in high school. I'm like, it's the best day of your life. She's like, why? I'm like, cause it's the only one that's guaranteed right now. The one that we're in right now, because and make it understand that. And as much as I tell her that I still, we all, you know, we still have that little guy on our shoulder that says do stupid things, but it's starting to get to the point where you can put the ego aside. You can start to live, actually live the, the, the saying of whatever uh, the biggest fear is having lived and never really lived. Like that hits me as hard as anybody because I went through and I've been through and I still go through, you know, you have your anxious thoughts is, you're not really present if you're having those thoughts. No, and you know what, dude? And, and, and not to get all religious in here, I do believe that everything in life happens for a reason. And whether we understand it or not. But there's a little... I have a smart pastor who told me, for all the days that you've lost in that rut, you'll gain them back. Because you need it to be... Think about that rut like the weight room, like you were just breaking your muscle down to make it stronger, right? From the outside looking in, I look at you as a guy who was a first round pick, was on top of the world, anxiety got the best of you, but your best days are ahead of you because now you've been at all levels. You've been at the top and you've been at the bottom. You, I can tell you right now, you haven't looked in the field and say that guy has anxiety, that guy has anxiety, that guy... Because I know that I can spot it from a mile away, and I'm sure you have the same talent. Dude, I talk we've to been guys. There. Guy, I talk to guys. And you go, right? You, you, I'll tell them. Like, you hey. tell them, hey, it's okay. Yeah, well, and keep I'll, it real with me, guys. Yeah, I, I, I've sat down with guys in Toronto, players. I've thought that I'm like, hey, dude, is this what's going on? They're like, how do you know? I'm like, because, dude, I've been there. I'm a king of that shit. Well, and, and you <laughs> just well, you know though, right? Like, and and it's. And they're like, no way. I'm like, yeah, I've been there, dude. I, I talked to there's a pitcher who I know who had anxiety bad. And well, Zach Granke was one of them. Yeah. And look what he did this year. But there's, but it, like, it's just so many people. I, I, I told him, I was like, hey, I bet you the nighttime is a tough time for you. And he's like, oh, what? And I, he's, he looked at me like, how do you know that? And I was like, because, dude, I've been there. Other people have been there. You're not alone. And he was like, dude, that may, thank you for saying that. And it's, but it's continuing 
to be able to pull down the barriers, which I think we're doing a better job of, of understanding mental health and like really talking about anxiety and different things. Is Kevin Love just came out with the Cavaliers. He's big. I mean, the guy thought he was having a heart attack in the middle in the of the game. Halftime. I know. But that's but that's where more and, he and was more a guy with a lot of pressure. I mean, Kevin Love was a guy who was supposed to perform for the Cavaliers, dude. That but more and more guys are starting to pull down. The other day, there was an offensive lineman. Uh, oh with, yeah, the guy with the, uh, Ravens. Yeah, I think. We, what, no, or were the Eagles. Oh yeah, maybe the, well, I and forgot he, what which team. He said he had he's had it under control, and, and he had a relapse. And he had a little a, bit of. But that's but that's what I'm saying. Where I say I'm never done with it, and I continue talking about it, and we continue to be able to share each other's stories and talk and 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 be able to have those conversations because you still can go down to that dark road and mm-hmm. to and and sometimes as much as we sit here and say hey don't touch this is hot don't touch this is hot sometimes we touch you're like oh I'm stupid it's hot and like yeah I told you that for the last month but you have to be able to understand that to continue to get better and I think that's something for me is that I why I like talking about it so much I obviously can talk about it all day um is because I think the more people share the stories the better that will be as a, as a community and as just humans to understand like maybe that's maybe that person we save a person or two or three or ten because they're not alone and the more that we talk about it the more you heal and the more that fear loses its power over you i've met people who had it horrible and from one day to the next it was just like ripped out of their soul i'm like what happened he's like dude you just get sick of being fucking sick yeah I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that's freedom. It's, dude, there's... You know, and I think that's where I'm at. Don't get me wrong. It lingers in me. I'm predisposed to it. I, I know that for yeah, a fact. Yeah, we, we battle like, it. it. It's, you're not supposed... Yes, like, it, it, it happens. I, I can trait back my family. Like, dude, this is, this is part of my blood. Like, we all have it, right? Like, I'll give you an example. You know, watching last night's event, which started off here in Miracle Mile. I don't know if you saw the yeah, whole thing, yeah. right? That triggered me a little bit. I'm like, bro, here's a guy, a UPS driver. Like, that that makes me, like, a little uneasy and anxious because I got two kids, bro, and I just want to go home and work. I want to work my ass off and have fun and go home. And I start thinking, dude, you know what? What you just said, today is, that, that guy thought that that was his day. He was a, he was a UPS driver, dude working for his family you know what i'm saying and that there was there was a there was a you know so i gotta read this because there was a thing that i've always kept and it was by um steve jobs i'll find this here and it always stood out to me because it's it it talks about mortality but it puts it in a perspective and it kind of it kind of like stuck out to me Right, so it impacted you. Remember, remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make big decisions in life because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, which we all battle, all fear of embarrassment or failure, which is exactly what me in the box, all these different things, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving you what only is truly important. Remembering that you're going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You're already naked. There's no reason to follow your heart. And that was one thing that stood out to me because I was like, dude, dude, I was that guy. I was the fear of failure, the fear of embarrassment, all these expectations. And it's not just in sport, though. You have that in the real life. People have that in relationships. People have that. that, That's what that is. And and it's it's the pride of of like. You know, hey, if I'm dating somebody, if I'm not good enough, or if I'm playing on a field, this or my now I've now I struggle at times with, am I going to be on TV for the rest of my life? Is that what I'm supposed to do? How am I impacting people? Is this going to be the way I make my living? I don't. What happens if they fire me? What am I going to do? Like, those are things that go through my head. Mm-hmm. But I have to step back and go control what I can control. <coughs> this is where I'm at right now. Enjoy it because tomorrow, like that UPS driver that was ready to go to work, may not happen. So we we worry our lives so much and then we die. And so it's like, why did we worry? I, I, and I use this analogy to people in business sometimes that, that 
they don't understand. Like they're like, oh, I don't with baseball. I don't get it. Is like the the sense of I lost my train of thought for a second. What was it? The so with baseball. Yeah, how how I used to tell people in business. Fuck. It's That's okay. Happens to me all the time too. Gosh, they don't come back. Is <laughs> that? But. <laughs> But that's – those are things like – it's pissing me off that I don't remember what I was going to say. It's okay. I, I, I don't remember what was a lot of stuff too, so don't you worry Damn about it. Damn it. I got to remember this. It's going to make me mad because it's a, it's a big point. It's – Oh, here it is. So, for example, and this is how our brains work, right? You're the boss. Right. Let's say you're not the boss. Mm-hmm. Right? Let's say you're just an employee, and your boss says, "Hey, I need to see you Friday, 9 a.m. in my office." And it's Thursday. Your Thursday is fucking ruined because the your your brain doesn't go like, "Oh, here comes my uh, that that big bonus that I expected." Your brain goes, "Oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? I'm gonna get fired." And you literally worry that entire night. You don't get any rest. And you get to the business meet, you get to your meeting, and he sits down and he goes, hey, dude, I just want to tell you you're doing a phenomenal job. And you're like, holy fuck, dude, I just literally wasted my entire 24 hours, so scared of what was going to happen, all these different issues. I, I literally, the movie in my head went a thousand different ways, and I did it for what? For nothing. I wasted my time. And that's, that's how I tell people is like, that's how my brain was on the athletic side is I was so scared of being sent down. What are people going to think? I was the MVP of AAA. How do I get sent back down to AAA? What, what's going on? I'm not, I'm not the guy that I used to be. Da, da, da. And, I, and I play all these scenarios in my head and I was so worried. You think you were identifying with that? You think that you found your identity in that? Like, like in being... Like, and being that, like, in other words, there's JP, right? That there's the real JP, and then there's the JP who plays baseball, which is also real. But the real you is really this who you are in your heart, in your mind, yeah. who your friends are, your family. Do you think that players and people make the mistake of, like, creating this self, this unrealistic image of who you are? 100%. I know, dude. dude I, I it's was. Un, it's so unnecessary. It, but it's sure. but it's our pride and ego, dude. It's our ego that it's the same ego who was in with the Texas Rangers. I was my fourth year in the big leagues, and I was so scared of being sent down the triple A out. Every time I'd come into the clubhouse because I had I had started off slow, I was like, hey, oh, the coaches, oh, the coaches coming to talk to me. Oh my god, and they'd be like, hey, we're gonna have early BP, and I'd free, I'd calm down till the time they called me in the office, and my heart's coming through my chest. Because here's this thing that I feared so much was being sent down. Like, what a loser I am, right? In my head, like, how am I going to tell people, my wife, to this or that? And they sent me down, and I got the AAA, and I remember walking into the AAA clubhouse going like, dude, you're such an idiot. Like, you made I, – I, you would have thought that I was dead. Like, if I got sent down, that it was the end of the world. And I got there, and I was like, all right, I'm alive. Like, okay, let's get to work. And, it, and I was like, you made – I was playing for the last month, walking the home play going, if you don't get a hit, you're going to get sent down to AAA. And then you have the fan like, hey, going back to AAA. And I'm like, fuck, I know. I need to get out of this. And but I made it this such this like crazy thing because I was so prideful. I was, my ego could not take that hit that I, it, it it unraveled me. And then when I got there, I was like, and I, was, I wasted my time. We base this company on the fact that there's no ego here. Like we always say, check your ego at the door. Nobody's bigger in the program. I'm not bigger. Just, I, you know, I'm the A. You know, there's Jones, Alvarez, guys who are, right? I, I'm just one of them. And I just happen to be called to, to help coach and lead. But I'm not bigger than Jack. Neither is Doug and neither is Lewis. And, and we learned that in sports. Like, nobody's bigger than the program. Think about this. One of my good friends played in the Patriots for a while. And he told me his first, his first time ever In the meeting room, Belichick undresses Tom Brady. First day of camp, undresses Tom Brady, first day of camp. And 
he's like, dude, if that guy can get undressed, everybody can get undressed. But it it set the tone because it was like exactly like you're saying. Check your ego. Out. This is not about Tom Brady. This is not about. This is about coming, and and that's why they win. And 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 he's telling me stories. And I'm like, that's why these guys win, dude. Because the head guy is blowing up a goat, right? This guy's mm-hmm. the man. And the first day on practice, he's blowing him up, telling him, "Hey, you're not that special." So just and it set the tone for everybody to go like, it's something. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's not. It's like it's about all of us being one. And I think that's why they win, dude, because of a person like that, that sets the tone for everybody else. And that's why things work. The ego has to, the, our biggest, our biggest enemy is our ego, dude. I have a book that's called the ego is the enemy. Like our biggest issue is the enemy. I agree. Or ego is our biggest enemy. Ego to me stands for edging God out. You put yourself above everybody. All right, two things as we wrap this up. What advice do you have for players, whether it be at the college level, any player that's up and coming, specifically at the big league level, what advice would you give those players who you know that exist, that are out there, that are going through this? I mean, talk about it. Uh-huh. Be vulnerable. Uh, my, my number one thing would be to say, first off, be vulnerable. And that's a tough thing. We're talking ego. That's a tough thing to do. It's a tough thing to go to a friend and tell tell them that you're struggling with baseball or you're struggling with women or you're struggling with this. It's a tough thing as a as a guy to just go. I think it's okay not to be okay. No, it's a it's a hundred percent okay not to be okay, right? But that's it's being able to go. Hey, be vulnerable enough to go. Hey, dude, I'm in a bad place right now. And then I know you're not alone, bro. Like and we're, get help. We're gonna, we're gonna get all this. And get help about it because mm-hmm. it's another tough thing to do is to go like, hey, I'm going to I'm gonna actually get help and actually talk to somebody because, again, we talk and it gets better. And then the second thing that I would say is after all the stuff that I've been through, I'm still here, right? And at times when you're in those situations, you feel like you're never going to get out of it. Mm-hmm. And that's the scariest part when I used to have those panic attacks is my one thought used to be, is this the one that stays forever? Mm-hmm. And to understand that it's not going to be forever. And nothing is forever. Only thing that you're guaranteed in life is death and taxes, right? Like it's going to, you're going to get over it. And that's, that's one thing that people have to understand is there is a light on the end and at the other end of the tunnel as as grim as sometimes may be as much as it's i've been in a panic attack and going where is my life going and stressed or whatever it may be understand that there is you there is that light and i think that's something that will help you too is if you know like hey the comforting side of like you're gonna be okay i think mlb should use you I think you'd be an amazing instrument to MLB because, I mean, that's always your sport. And that you, the same way a scout can identify that guy that's like in the 30th round and he sees something, I think your ability to identify that guy's having some some mental challenges right now, you can help a lot of teams out. And I think there's a lot of value. I think if, if MLB in the union really wants to care about their players, I think you'd be a great asset. Well, and at least... And not to go on, but at least one thing they'd have to do is at least have it with somebody in the union. I'm not a, a doctor. I don't, somebody in the union, that's a third party. Cause yeah. what happens is all these teams and I tell teams this, you guys have your psychologist, you guys have your mental coach. Sorry, but no one wants to use them because everybody says like, Hey, this guy gets paid by this team. So if the GM is going to call somebody, Hey, what, what's this guy like? So they don't trust him. So that's why they have these guys, but they're useless. And that's why guys Still keep it all inside. They're gonna, they're gonna release you. Or yeah, they're gonna they're gonna say what. And there goes your money. And so that's and that's where, I think that it has to be the union that has to do something like that, to where guys can, come and have that conversation and feel, protected. What's the future look like for JP? Man, I, I hope that I would be at a national level. Uh, I do want to continue. I'm actually working on trying to settle up some things on like an anxiety podcast and mm-hmm. like really getting deep into that stuff with a Kevin Love or DeRozan or that, that line or a, a business person, like really getting into that. Mm-hmm. 
and honestly, there's times with me that I'd like to either own a business or manage, be at a position because I feel like I really understand what it's like to make people put a, make an environment that people can succeed in because I've been the guy that's been in the environment that sucks and you realize how big of a difference just saying hi to somebody can make and making a person feel like they're just a, an actual human being uh, and caring for somebody, how much more that person will be and be better than just uh, not. So, I mean, people have told me that I should manage and I... You want better than the big leagues? Yeah, the thing is, dude, the grinds of the minor leagues is tough, man. And I don't know if I'm if I don't know if I'm up to that. You but don't think they'll you think they would want to put you through a minor league? Yeah, no, for sure. I've been offered gigs to then they'll tell you, you know, you gotta work your way, which which is fine. But I just the yeah. T V stuff is awesome. At the end of the day, I wanna impact people and continue to impact people. So I don't know if it's at some point in my life I'd like to maybe create like either a website or something or a TV station or something where people can go to and have that, that, you know, when I'm having a pa panic attack at two o'clock, I'm not turning on ESPN to try to go on ESPN. I'm going to turn on a rate. I'm going to turn on a, a channel that possibly has a story of somebody or is giving some kind of relief to, because people, they need it 24 seven. I think you should put on, start off with on your phone, dude, and just start there. We did it. I mean, we, we we brought a lot of brand awareness. You know, everybody's on social media. You'd be surprised, man. I mean, when I started this podcast, this podcast was literally, I told my wife when I was going through this years ago, I'm not going to suffer in vain. I started this podcast because of the same reason. I wanted to share my story, and I realized that a lot of athletes whose careers ended, they were in tough transition. And I, I And what I thought was this little thing has, I mean, I got guys like you in here, you know? I would have never met you if it wasn't because of this podcast. So I believe that God uses uh, his people, bro. And, 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 and again, you haven't suffered in vain, dude, you know? You, you've been through it. You know the past, and you don't need to go there no more. And, and I, I don't, you know what? Every once in a while, I wanted to leave, and there's this weird part of me that doesn't because it keeps me humble, and it keeps me... Uh, aware of what's important and you know I, I i never want what i can't handle well uh, and we could end at this however <laughs> you want it but I, there's something that i read that talked about like learning how to embrace your anxiety because if you go into what anxiety is right or or that adrenaline it's preparing you for something right mm -hmm. i'm a hunter Right, I, when I I, I, I'm, I like to hunt animals, yeah, the right? Fight, the fire flea response. Yeah. When I, when a deer would come out, dude, my heart's coming out of my chest, and I used to go, dude, you are such a bitch. Like, why do you get so scared? And I finally, after learning over years, it's like, no, dude, that's what you're getting ready. You're now all of a sudden your focus is getting ready because you're getting ready to do something. And so, if you get to look at anxiety, like you said, I kind of welcome it, is because. Now you look at it and you switch it. Is it being a bad thing of going, hey, dude, this is preparing me for something. I don't know what it's preparing me for, but this is preparing me for this conversation or it's preparing me for another situation in my life. But oh, no. if you can flip the script on it a little bit, it's being able to, to that's why you know, you're you okay with the opportunity to have it because it's like, all right, am I, am I maybe lacking somewhere that I do have to make sure I keep my routine, prepare my preparation, lock it back in like so there's a there's something to that too 90 percent of, of we represent some really large clients and i i've always been open about this like i'm you'd be surprised how many people have told me yeah it's called it's, it's, it's a part of the game so but dude thanks for coming on i appreciate thanks it. for having me sorry i talked too long no i can talk all day dude, dude. i can go all day with this too i mean like i said this is the, one of the main reasons why i started this podcast so can people find you on Instagram or anything? Or you start or, or yeah, I'm on, website? Uh, I'm on Instagram. Uh, I think it's like JP Aaron CB9. Okay. Uh, or 40, JP Aaron CB44. But once you come out with your stuff, let me know and then we'll put it up on our stories and we'll definitely yeah. copy as much as we can. Yeah, so we'll see. I just want to keep talking about it, man. There's a, it's, you're not, there's a saying, you're not, you're not weak. You know, you're not, it's just, we all struggle, man.